Good morning, everybody. Um, this is my first time teaching at Echo Church Institute, so it is a privilege. Um, you guys had a pastor do the lessons, and it was very preachy. And then you had a Azusa professor give the lesson, and it was very much where she gave a handout. It's like a teacher, the whole thing. But I'm an engineer, and so I prepared a study that's very engineering, where I put assumptions in, and then I tell you how the thing works, and then I tell you what the machine does, and then the machine being ministry in the church. So it's a very engineering kind of approach to it, but um, I think it's great. I learned a lot while prepping it, so I'm going to pray, and then we'll just get right into it. Okay? God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for the folks that were able to make it here safely. Um, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me and use my prep and use your spirit mostly just to um, teach and to let us know more about you and how to serve you better in the church and how we do that as men and women of the church, Lord. So speak through me and help our hearts be um, humble and comfortable just to listen to what you say in your word and to accept it and to learn about you, Lord. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, um, we've gone through base biblical masculinity and base biblical femininity. We've gone through in the home, 50 lessons, and now we're going to start two parts of ministries in the church. So how do biblical masculinity and femininity work in the church? And the first part is ministries available to all saints, which there's a lot. There's a lot of crossover. If it's a Venn diagram, it's like mostly just one circle with a little bit on the edges. Whereas, um, next lesson, Jackson will lead that one, and then we're going to go into how the roles are different inside of the church. But primarily, they're very similar. So, um, we wanted to lay the foundation of how they're similar before they're different, just so we can not get so focused on just how they're different, but then just look first on how they're similar. Um, there's a lot more general instructions given in the New Testament to believers as a whole, and there are, there are differences between men and women. And as an overall default, Paul writes in reference to being a child of God, there is no distinction between uh, men and women. So Galatians 3, 26 through 29, that before faith came, we were held captive by the law, under the law, um, in prison until the coming of our, faith, of our faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified through faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, no female or male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So, unless otherwise specified, the roles of men and women are the same in the church. Men and women are considered children of God once they place their faith in Christ, and this entails the promise of salvation, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the command to follow Jesus' teachings for the rest of your life. And part of these teachings are instructions for all the children of God on how to conduct oneself in church. Um, since this Sunday school is about the ministries available to all saints, we'll dive into what ministry is and what the general commands are for all the saints, which are Christians. Ministries are how we serve the church for the goal of the gospel. Um, simply put, ministry just means service. Um, without making this like a whole Greek study, because that's not what this is, um, I looked into just what ministry is and how it's referenced in the Bible, and often, or primarily, it's described from a word called diakonia, which is a Greek word that means either service or ministry. So, ministry is not just the work for pastors that get paid for it, but ministry means service. The same word for service is also translated to ministry. So, all ministries, whether volunteer or on staff at a church, um, are simply services we do for the Lord. We do this ministry service in the local church, as a church, empowered by God, and for the gospel to spread. So before we get into the ways of how men and women are called to serve the church, I wanted to establish what the church is, and where we do ministry. Then I wanted to describe how our hearts and minds should be as we serve Him in church. And then lastly, um, I'll talk about how we can serve Him in the church as servants, both the women, men and women of Christ. So there's the outline. Sorry, I should have put that up a little bit before. Uh, but that's how it's. We'll establish what the church is and how we serve and then what we do to serve. So, before getting into the different ministries and types of service, I wanted to solidify who we are as Christians. Um, as we saw before in the last verse, um, we're all heirs if we put our trust in Jesus for salvation. But we're also servants. So in 2 Corinthians 6, while Paul is instructing his listeners on how to conduct themselves despite hardships, he refers to himself and his listeners as servants of God. He writes in 2 Corinthians 6, we put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be 
found within our, with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. To be Christian is to be a servant and one who ministers. Service is for all Christians, not just those on staff or have been a member for a year or any other a lot of time. To be a Christian is to be a servant for God. Um, while we act as servants personally to God, there's a special role God has for a group of servants acting together. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes about the role of the church and the mission of God. In Ephesians 3, he writes, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of this, all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone who is the plan the mystery hidden for the ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Paul was specifically called to be a minister of the gospel to the Gentiles. However, we are called to be servants of God generally once we're Christians. The important point here is that rather than Paul saying, I came to minister to the Christians so that the manifold wisdom of God would be revealed by individuals whenever they want to, however they want to, he said, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might not be made known to the rulers and authorities. This manifold wisdom of God, although it sounds kind of ethereal and weird, um, it's really his plan for salvation through faith in his son Jesus Christ. That's what the manifold wisdom of God is referring to there. Um, the word translated here, church, here uh, means broadly a gathering of Christians called out of the homes into a public place. Um, and here this refers to a public gathering of Christians to worship God. But a public gathering of people out of their homes isn't the only definition for a church. Um, if the word church is a group where people gather publicly, is God's tool to make known his manifold wisdom, then this is a really important tool God has. And we should know exactly what the church is, whether it's just a public gathering or if it's more some specific. Um, the New Testament gives a lot of information about the church to shed light on what it is, to do like analogies, church polities, requirements for leadership, Commands, encouragements are mentioned throughout various letters by various people in the New Testament. Um, the church is an assembly of Christians who gather publicly, yes, but since the church is talked about further in the New Testament, it's clear that there's more to just public gathering. Um, rather, there are more components to define the church. Since this isn't a Sunday school on church structure, I'm not going to just get into the politics of it and what it means to be like Southern Baptist compared to whatever else, right? Um, but I just wanted to highlight what the church is, and then we can ask questions about it. And then, um, so, there's two references of the church in the New Testament often. There's the universal church and the local church. Um, Paul writes about the universal church um, in Ephesians 2. He says, Consequently, you are no, no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Here, Paul is writing about the universal church, saying that you, Christian, are fellow citizens of God's people and members of his household. Um, but, sorry, I'll get into the, the local thing. He, he mentions we are all part of the household of God. Um, Jonathan Lehman is an author for Nine Marks, and he wrote that little blue church membership book that you probably got when you were um, going through the whole membership training. He writes about the universal church. He says, the universal church is a heavenly and eschatolo eschatological assembly of everyone past, present, and future who belongs to Christ's new covenant and kingdom. So that's the universal church. The New Testament authors write letters to individual churches with various admonishments and encouragements. These local assemblies are referred to as churches and are distinct from the universal church mentioned previously. Within these local churches, the biblical authors write about specific social dynamics within these groups, showing that there's a difference in importance between a local assembly of people in a church and the universal identification of the church. Um, John Lehman also describes the local church saying, a local church is a mutually affirming group of New Covenant members and kingdom citizens identified by regularly gathering together in Jesus' name through preaching the gospel and celebrating in so, I wanted to say all this. This isn't a, a lesson on just the church, but I wanted to establish what the church is, and that it's not just a public gathering, but it's a, it's a group of people who are baptized believers and who are local and acknowledging each other as believers and following the ordinances and following Jesus' commands so that we can know what we do in that type of group. 
It's not just people gathering publicly, but it's, it's more than that. So, any questions on that before I move forward? I know I'm talking a lot, kind of long-winded. Any questions? Okay. How do we church? This is the second part. And this part is um, pretty just exhausting. made up that word as a verb. What? Church. Church? <laughs> church is a verb. Church. Church. How do we church? <laughs> It's, it's cool to do that, to make nouns verbs. Um, like how do I sweater? I sweater yellow. That's what's <laughs> okay, how do we church? Men and women are both equally adopted children of God, and through adoption have entered into service for God. We established that. The primary way we enact this service is through the local church, which is not just a, a public gathering, but is more than that. Before we get into what we do as service to God, I want to analyze how we approach service. As an overview, I'm going to get through each one of these points, but we've we serve God by following Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, with wisdom, selflessly, diversely, lovingly, and for the growth and edification of the church. So I'm going to go through each one of those, and then we're going to look into what the actual ministries are, the actual service we do is. So first, I want to establish who leads the church. Spoiler alert, it isn't Jackson. Paul writes in Ephesians with the context of Jesus being far above all rule and authority and above every name that is named. Um, Paul writes... And he, God the Father, put all things under his feet, which is Jesus, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In every church that's ever existed, there's only been one overall leader, and that's Jesus. If a church body doesn't acknowledge Jesus as the first leader in the church, then they will always do ministry with the first step wrong. Before elders and small group leaders and famous theologians, our greatest example and teacher is Jesus. Second, the ability we have to do service for the church is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes about Christians and the enabling of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians, saying, Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can ever say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts by the same Spirit. There are varieties of service by the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them, all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In verse 3, it shows that you simply claiming Jesus as Lord is evidence for the Holy Spirit working in you. Verses 4 through 6 shows that the same God who gave his Spirit to empower Jesus gives the same Spirit to enable us to do his ministry, his service. So in order to serve in ministry, we must first be following Jesus and acknowledging Jesus as our overall leader, and then recognize our need for the Spirit to work out service in us. Um, a short but needed tangent is to then cover now why we serve the Lord in church. Um, then I'll just explain again like how we how we serve Him. I'm explaining the why part now because the verses that I use to explain why we serve God brings up a term that I'm going to use also to help define how we should serve God um, in the church. So, absolutely, part of the aim of serving God is to increase the size of this church. The Great Commission instructs the apostles, um, as well as us, to make disciples of all nations. In the Wednesday night Bible studies through 1 John, we see in chapter 1, verse 3, John explaining that he has fellowship with Jesus through the gospel, and he writes to them so that they make sure in that same fellowship. So 1 John 1, 3 says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you may too have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We proclaim the gospel, like John and Paul did, for the purpose of growing the universal church. But Paul elaborates in 1 Corinthians on the purpose of our servitude, by writing that all ministries are for the building up of the church. In 1 Corinthians 14, he says, What then, brothers, when you come together in church? Each one a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up, which is edification. Edification is the same word derived from building up. This building up doesn't simply mean increasing the size of the church, although that is part of the purpose. Rather, it's a metaphor to establishing and strengthening the church. That's what edification means. The word translated to build up, oh, I just said that, I'm sorry. Um, Strong's is a concordance that defines a lot of the Greek words. Now I don't want to Greekify this too much. I just looked into it to help give words and depth to the words that we trust are translated in the Bible. But looking deeper into that word, this word for building up of edification means to promote growth in Christian wisdom, affection, grace, virtue, holiness, and blessedness, and to give strength and courage. So following Jesus, we serve in ministries to build up the church, both increasing the group who follow Jesus, so growing the size of the church, as well as strengthening to grow it. So the, the 
why we serve this like an orchard. We expand the boundaries of this orchard to grow more seeds of Christians, but also to build up and grow the little saplings into full-grown trees that produce fruit. So that's the purpose of why we do these things. But I wanted to establish that building up because that building up is used to describe how we build up in the following verses. So continuing on to how we serve. Any questions so far before I just keep rambling on for another five minutes? Okay, continuing on to how we serve. Paul uses the same word for building up that translates or for edification and building up. Earlier in 1 Corinthians to describe how we should have wisdom in the ways we serve. 1 Corinthians 10, 23-24 says, All things are lawful, but all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up or edify. Let not one, let one let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. So our mission for building up the church is not simply, simply to pick the first thing that we think would build up the church and go with it. But Paul writes that we need to be careful and aware of what we're doing. He writes that not all things are helpful, so we should be intentional and wise about when we should hold certain ministries and when we should not hold certain ministries. There's not a need for everything at every time. We should be wise about that. Verse 24 on that last part says that let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. It looks like a quick note Paul just tacked on as he's writing a bunch of encouragements and things. But I think that that's actually a really foundational way in which we serve. After Paul writes that we should seek the good of his neighbor, he writes about eating food with others and how not to offend them. And then it's like 10 verses that I won't labor through. But in verse 32 of that same chapter, he says, Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. The whole purpose of why we serve. This thought of considering others brings really closely to the description of the greatest commandments Jesus gives in Mark chapter 12. He says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. There is no other commandment greater than these. We're supposed to serve God in our ministries selflessly, how Paul describes it before, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many. We should seek the betterment of those around us and to serve them not as a guest or someone you voted in a year ago that you don't know very well, but as someone we know really well. Ourselves. We should serve them as ourselves, which is selflessly. Next, we're to serve differently than one another. I want to revisit a text we already looked at, 1 Corinthians 12. Um, now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of... So, I'm reading here. Sorry. I skipped three. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. A couple verses down, it reads a larger chunk. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of one body, though many, for we are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink in one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it less part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts in one body. And continuing on to the end of that chapter in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, Helping administration in various kinds of tongues, or administrating, sorry, in various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess the gifts of healing, do all speak tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. That was a bit long winded, but I wanted to read that whole chapter pretty much all in context because I think it displays something amazing. One of the most beautiful aspects about the Christian church is how diverse we are. Across different cultures and ages, incomes and interests and professions, we can be united by the most important thing, our faith and our servitude to God. And not only that, but we're gathered together with this in mind in the local church. God specifically made us different and uses our differences to bring about different methods of strengths and service. 
as different body parts are needed for healthy body to function correctly, a church with a diversity in abilities, perspectives, and talents are needed for a healthy church body to function correctly. And then lastly, on how we're, we're called to serve lovingly. Paul describes, just after the end of 1 Corinthians 12, going into chapter 13, he says, For earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still more an excellent way. If I speak in tongues of the men of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clinging symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. And we all know this verse because it's printed on mugs and posters and everything. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. I say that because the beginning of chapter 13, he's saying, if I do these services, if I do this ministry without love, without this how, this, this crucial how part, then it's for loss. It doesn't matter. And so this definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13 is essential to how we do service. When describing the faith in Jesus leading to righteousness instead of the law, Paul writes to the Christians in Galatians 5, saying, For you, brothers, who are called to freedom, but do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another in love. Do ministry selflessly in love. To recap everything said so far, we sh how we sh the way we should, how do I say it? To recap everything so far, how we serve is by following Christ as the leader of the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, given to us with wisdom, selflessly, diversely, and lovingly for the growth and edification of the church. Um, now, before I get into what we do as services, is there any questions on how? I don't know. Not really a question, but sure. yesterday I was with some of my unbelieving friends who've like never been to church at all. And so the, just the concept of what we do building every week is so foreign to them. So they were asking me, you know, where do you go? What do y'all do? And yeah. they were just so curious. And it just has challenged me on the language I use when describing my local church family. Because it really does influence how a person views Christianity, yeah. the concept of God. And I think there's just so much hurt in the world by poor representations of church. Mm -hmm. And so it you know, it just has motivated me, and first of all, I'm so thankful to be in a church family that I can brag about easily, but, um, you know, someone, someone who hears the language of we are family, we are like in a body serving together, we're serving the community, that goes a lot farther than, yeah, we have to come every Sunday, or yeah. do these things, you know, it's just all about the language used, yeah. and the verses you're pointing out just beautifully uses that language. Thank you, yeah. And it's and as a family, yeah, we're not just doing this to make our lives better. This isn't just like a, a positive self-growth club. And it's not just to make our community better, but it's to lead them to Christ, which is ultimately does those things. It increases this the happiness in their life because they're focused on Christ rather than whatever else they got going on. And it increases just like their lack of or it decreases their loneliness because they're just like in a group that really cares for them and they can care for. Um, but ultimately, the first purpose is just like to have them know Jesus, and so I think there's a lot of attractiveness. I think Jane mentions that in the services. There's a lot of like attractiveness just about being a Christian and having the hope we have. But if someone wants that without Jesus, then they're not ever going to get it. So it's um, it's hard because in order to without preaching, but in order to have that sense of family and that sense of hope, you have to make this huge leap of just dying to yourself and then being resurrected to Christ to serve Him, and so. So I'm glad that verses are giving you good language for your friends. Okay. Ministries available to all the saints. What we do to serve. There are many different specific ways that we can serve God in the church and as a church. And in my research, all the ways we can serve God boils down to three distinct categories, which is teaching the true gospel, loving one another, and worshiping God. Out of these three categories comes all the specific acts of service that we do within the church or as a church. I'll describe each of these three categories and show some scripture to reference these categories and also describe how we map these formally as a church and then informally just as Christians. Um, we can all serve the church in these formal and informal ways.
ways. So as I described the formal and informal ways, these are ways that we can practically serve as servants of God. Um, these three categories are put together by my own reading of the New Testament, and then also from Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. He has a big list of 11 means of grace, and so I organize those into these three major categories, and then I also just read a bunch of the New Testament and just saw what they're talking about, and it led to these three categories. So, um, any questions about the systematic thing at all? Okay. I made a big chart, if you don't need it. But teach the true gospel. So, Matthew 28, 16, this is the, um, this is the Great Commission, starting in verse 18, sorry, not 16. What was that? That's my sermon. Okay. This is? I actually just like walked into your computer and I found out and stole it. No. Um, verse 18 starts and says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There are many verses in the New Testament that instruct apostles and disciples to teach the gospel. Although this, these verses of the Great Commission don't explicitly use the word gospel, it informs the apostles to teach all that Jesus commanded them, which would include the gospel itself. This gospel, in brief, is that Jesus, the prophesied Messiah, took the punishment of death that we deserve as sinners, enemies to God's kingdom, and trusting that he took our punishment, we are adopted into God's family as children, gaining justification for our sins, and that Jesus was 100% God and 100% human, perfect in every way, and the only means to which we have salvation. This gospel was taught by the various apostles and disciples of Jesus throughout the first century with the warning that if anyone preaches a different gospel than this one, they are not of God and they are not to be trusted. This gospel is to be preached both publicly and privately and defended when we hear it professed and correctly. Along with teaching the gospel of forgiveness for our sins, we're to also teach believers to live above reproach. This is part of what Jesus was teaching. As Christ followers, we're to follow in the footsteps of Christ and display him as a church. This means to pursue holiness in everything. We're called to be upright in our conduct so that non-believers don't have grounds to call us out on wrongdoing. In fact, our conduct should display good deeds leading other people to then glorify God and to trust in Him. So, under teaching, formally, this category of the true gospel is done um, first at the pulpit, um, then Echo Church Institute, where you are today, which Kyle just came into. Welcome. <laughs> um, we teach the gospel formally through evening service devotionals, uh, Bible studies at the church, Bible study leaders in, um, sorry, Bible studies at the church, Bible studies um, in our homes by leaders of the church, and then in the children's classroom, classrooms. In all six of these categories, leaders are teaching others about the true gospel and instructing them about living a life without sin. Informally, these teachings should be done in our everyday lives for our family, friends, coworkers, and strangers around us. Informally, everyone in the church is to be teaching what Jesus taught, defending the gospel by calling out when we hear it professed incorrectly, and living upright ourselves, demonstrating a life following Jesus through our conduct. If we're not teaching the gospel, defending the gospel, and living a life pure and light of the gospel, then we're not acting as a Christian church. We're just talking about Jesus. The second way in which we serve, um, or the second category of ministry, I should say, is to love one another. Four different authors um, describe as loving one another, and I'm just going to go through each, all four of them. So Hebrews 10, starting in verse 23, says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, as all the more you see the day drawing near. James chapter 2, verse, starting in verse 1, and going to 8 and 9, says, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 1 Peter chapter 1 says in verse 22, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And last is the last author I'm going to look at. 1 John Chapter 3, and he says, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God is in him. And by, by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Loving our fellow believer is not simply to be close pals with the other members at church, but entails tangible ways that we can 
care for the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of our brothers and sisters in the faith. And this is an important theme of caring for one another because it's mentioned by various different authors in the New Testament. This isn't just a one-time mention by one letter in like a short verse, but this is mentioned by every or by multiple authors of the New Testament that we should love one another along with teaching the gospel. So it's really important. To highlight a few ways in which we can love one another in various ways it talks about it in the New Testament. It talks about prayer to love one another, meeting their needs through spiritual gifts, through fellowship, and then through discipleship. These things pop up in the New Testament. So I want to quickly go over each one of these and then like the last section I'll talk about, the formal ways we do that as a church, and then lastly in the informal ways we do these five things. So looking at praying. Praying is for one another. So praying for one another shows up commonly in Paul's letters. In the beginning of all the letters, you see him talking about these prayers and encouragements and what he feels and has been praying about them. Um, in these mentions of prayer and elsewhere, we're instructed to pray for others' health, for healing, for their steadfastness in following Jesus, and for thanksgiving for the belief given to them by God. Prayer is how we can orient our focus on the only one capable of providing blessings and asking him to give faith and strength, growth, hope, and courage for others, ourselves, and the church. Formally, as a church, we pray multiple times through the service on the Sunday morning through different themes. And then also we take time intentionally during evening services to pray for various things for people in our church. Um, another way we serve one another tangibly is through providing for one another's needs. This is demonstrated in the early church of Acts and is commanded to us in another bit written by James. We're instructed to use our material goods to provide for the basic needs of our fellow believers. This doesn't mean that we're supposed to pool all of our money together and give everyone the same salary. But it does mean that we should be aware if a brother or sister is struggling with just their ways of living, whether it's rent or food or clothing, and we should go out of our way to ensure that they have those basic needs and they're taken care of as if they are a member of our own family because they're considered brothers and sisters. Formally, we have a benevolence fund as a church for this exact purpose. Uh, this benevolence fund is money set aside in the budget that the elders can use with discernment to meet the basic needs of church members. Also, we love one another and take care of others' needs through um, volunteers in the kids' classrooms. Absolutely part of the purpose we have for the kids' classrooms, kids classrooms are to teach them the gospel and to defend it and to know right and wrong and to live upright. But another part of the kids' classrooms is just to give the parents their need of just rest. And so we care for meeting other people's needs through the kids' classrooms. And then other ways we care for the needs is through the setup team and the ushering team. When you come into church, you don't have to bring your own bread and communion. You don't have to sweep the front. We have an ushering team to make it warm and welcome and meet your needs just socialness, and then also the setup team to meet every physical, tangible need you have at church, so you can just show up. So we love one another formally as a church through those teams, as well as kids' ministry. Um, now, the third, the third um, how we love one another is spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts is a huge topic. It splits denominations sometimes, and I don't want to get so deep into it. I just want to touch on it for the sake of the last right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I spoke in German, it sounded like it. Um, yes, we have a. I'm. Okay. Um, I want to. They, because they're talked about as gifts of the Spirit, and that they are ways we can serve the church. I wanted to, to touch on them. Um, there's a couple lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. The one I like is from a verse we read like twice already. It's First Corinthians uh, chapter 12, and verse starting in verse four. This is where we're reading that huge chunk. Starting in verse four, it says. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For no one is given through the Spirit, or for to one, sorry, for to one is given the, through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by one and the same spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. I like this section because of the first couple of verses. So before it gets into just the list of the different ways the spirit gives us these spiritual gifts, it talks about the gifts, the service, and the activities. Whatever gift you have, whatever spiritual gift you have, 
is given to you because God granted you that gift extraordinarily. Then, with those gifts, there are different ministries to which we apply them to, literally different means of service. So first there's the gift, and then there's the acting out of that gift in service, whether it's for the teaching or defending, caring, exhorting, or growing of the church. And then that using of the gift for those different services results in activity. And that activity could also be translated to um, effect. And so this says that these gifts that are given to us are for service to bring about real effects and results within the church and the body. In any case, whether you're gifted by the Holy Spirit with helping or healing, tongues, interpretation, encouragement, um, administration, teaching, or prophecy, which is a communication of a revelation brought to you by God, it's prophecy. Gifts are used for building up the church. Um, formally, if you guys memorize the whole membership document, like I did, um, in our membership documents under the Statement of Faith, Section 13, titled, Of a Gospel Church, in our membership document, we all um, signed off on, we said, We believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by the covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ, governed by his laws, and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in him and them by his word. Formally, as a church, we acknowledge the gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit, and we trust that he, God, will move in people to use those gifts for the many ministries available throughout the church, be it teaching, small group discussions, prayer, kids ministry, etc. Because the Holy Spirit gives the gifts as he wills, this is not something that we can control and plan as a church. This isn't just something we sign off and say, well, this this group gets tongues, this group gets healing. The Holy Spirit gives us his gifts. We as a church simply allow the gifts to be used by people as they are moved by the Holy Spirit. Um, so moving on from there. We're called to meet physically. This is the category of fellowship. As we saw before during the defining of the church, part of that definition is public gathering of believers. We're called to see one another to teach, encourage. Uh, so we're called to see one another to teach, encourage, and exhort one another as fellow believers in Christ. And this fellowship is really important, because if we're called to lay our hands and pray for one another, how do we do that without meeting physically? How do we lay hands and pray for one another? If we are to call, if we are to know one another, but remain in our homes and avoid contact, how are we to understand each other's sins and encourage each other for right activity and discourage wrong actions? If we're blessed with a spiritual blessing by the Holy Spirit, but don't see our brothers and sisters in the faith, how are we going to use activity, how are we going to use service and bring out effects of the Holy Spirit's gifts in us if we don't see anyone physically? I'm sure you're familiar with this verse in Hebrews, but Hebrews chapter 12 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as is to the day drawn near. Fellowship is important. Formally, we pool a lot of money together to rent out a church building for fellowship. And that shows an extraordinary amount of faith that we use our funds to just rent out a great building for us just to meet in. So we can comfortably meet here. We can leave our stuff here. Part of how we fellowship um, is just contributing to us getting a building where we can meet in it. Um, another way we fellowship formally as a church is by meeting in the Bible studies every other Wednesday night at people's homes. Um, and then this last category of love one another as service is discipleship. Discipleship is vague. But it generally means helping your fellow believer in their continued walk with Jesus. This entails teaching truth from the Bible, but it also includes knowing your brother and sister, encouraging them in their faith, calling out sin, and simply growing them, growing, growing with them as a believer. Um, this New Testament, uh, the New Testament authors display this by enforcing true theology amongst the churches, showing the influence towards them, acknowledging harmful sins in their midst, and giving instructions for their spiritual life. These are all examples of discipleship given by the apostles. This area of loving one another is one of the most important for keeping a pulse on the spiritual and emotional health of our fellow believer. And as a unified body, we're to check for the sick and damaged and weak areas of the body to strengthen it to con for the continued mission of the church. A verse in Hebrews that touches on this is in chapter 3 of Hebrews. It reads, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, and if, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. In believing in Christ, we have a life-changing experience. We are now servants of God. But we're called, even daily, to 
be encouraging, to know one another, to help them on that walk that the author of um, Hebrews talks about. Formally, as a church, we encourage one-on-one -on -one discipleship between members of the church, but also the pastors spend a significant amount of time intentionally discipling and counseling members of the church. Um, however, most of the discipleship in the church is informal. Um, informally, all five of these means of loving one another should be happening in the church by um, members of the church. We should pray for one another as we hear about each other's lives and read posts on the Slack channel. We should be quick to provide the needs for our neighbor and help bear their burden that they carry, whether physically, emotionally, or spiritually. We should pray for the spiritual gifts by the Spirit and ask others for evidence of the gifts of the Spirit in our own lives and seek out ways to apply these spiritual gifts. We should, we should not shy away from meeting at church and in our homes. And we should be learning about Christianity from someone wiser than us through discipleship and encouraging the brother or sister seeking wisdom also through discipleship. Informally, we should be praying and providing and asking for the gifts of the Spirit and meeting together and discipling one another. Loving one another comes from a correct heart posture first, and that is something done personally with the Lord and cannot be forced through a formal arrangement by the church. Within the church, as a formal church member, as formal church members, we should be informally, sorry, let me read that again. Within the church, as formal church members, we should be informally loving one another as often as we can. Loving one another is the demonstration of our claim to follow Jesus. That's what James talks about in this episode. If we as a church claim to believe that Jesus died for our sins, yet refuse to love each other in the church in tangible ways, we're denying the faith on an elementary level. So the last way um, we serve God in the church is through worship. Um, we love God and adore Him through our worship and use our worship to take all the glory off of ourselves and put it on to Jesus. Wayne Grudem defined um, worship as the activity of glorifying God in His presence with our voice and our hearts. Um, our worship should resemble the utterance of elders in John's mission in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 4, he reads, where he writes, The 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast, out, they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Worshiping God in our songs, our speech, and our priorities as a church reminds us the only reason we are saved is due to God's great mercy he gives us through Jesus Christ. Additionally, our worship of God demonstrates to the world the importance of God above 1 Peter um, nicely recaps the various aspects of what we discussed and then describes at the end of our service, the, re like the, the end goal of our service and building up of the church is to glorify Jesus. So 1 Peter chapter 4 says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus describes in the Gospel of John also um, that all of our obedience to God and light of Jesus is his doing. John chapter 3, verse 21. This verse always blew my mind. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The New King James Version also translates this, um, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been wrought, W-R-O-G-H-T, wrought in God. In all of our servitude, God gets the glory. We are blessed to be able to be his servants, and our worship is simply aligning our heart to he who deserves our glory. Or deserves the glory, sorry. Formally, we worship the Lord um, corporately by how we structure our church service every Sunday. Through prayers, through the music, through the lighting, the catechism, the preaching, our aim is to conduct our worship service in a way that orients our hearts toward the being only. I need to do that. Through prayer, through music, lighting, catechism, preaching, our aim is to conduct our worship service in a way that orients our hearts towards the only being worthy of our worship. So, those three areas of service and all the different ways that we can serve sound maybe like a task list of ways that we just have to prove and prove and prove our faith. And if we don't do that, then we're not like the loved kid, we're not saved, but that's not true. I want to end by reiterating a gospel truth. 
We serve God first because He came to serve us. We love God because He first loved us. We do these things not to gain favor or faith, but to prove our faith is genuine. We're given faith by God, and these are just things we do as Christians. And we just compartmentalize them because there's different ways in which we serve. So, to reiterate the gospel truth and to end, uh, Titus chapter 3 reads, But we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want, to, I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. In conclusion, part of being a Christian is to belong to a local church body. Within this church body, we serve Jesus through different ministries, doing so with Jesus as our example, empowered by the Holy Spirit, with wisdom, selflessness, diversity, love, to spread the good news and to strengthen those who already believe. Let us be a church that teaches the true gospel, loves one another, and worships God together. Come on, pray. Lord, um, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for um, your word that we can learn from and we can encourage one another to follow and we can um, meditate on ourselves. Lord, I pray that you would instill these um, truths about how you save us and what you empower us to do so that we can then trust that um, you have and that we can go and serve you in the ways that you describe, Lord. So um, thank you for this morning and thank you for saving us so that we can now be servants to you rather than following the passions of our flesh and um, really being servants of the Savior, Lord. So thank you for revealing yourself and empowering us to serve you and um, adopting us into your family. We pray these things in Jesus.